real world data is essentially what we are capturing at the bedside from the patients or or in the clinics and and in a routine practice so if you look at the ACA which was approved in 2009 uh, in the last administration when when it was mandated that every clinician every clinic every hospital is going to have to uh, collect the data electronically in US and everybody ran to their next door uh, you know software companies to start uh, putting together uh, methods to start collecting the data locally so that led to this explosion of real world data it is sort of capturing of the data electronically but in in all reality we we've been collecting the real world data uh, for for decades you know we used to have these registries uh, uh, where we would uh, go out and collect patient level data from clinics and 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 hospitals and institutions the the key then is to have you sitting on this data but how do you develop insights out of that right how do you uh, develop those insights which could be informative for your internal and external team which could be informative for patients for informative for uh, clinicians informative for peers uh, and that's where the whole idea of how do you convert the real real world data into the evidence right so you have to apply different technological advancements the methods the statistical methods uh, the the methods which are out there which allow us to play with the real world data now which you're capturing and applying those uh, techniques to convert into the evidence which could be meaningful insightful simple for stakeholders to utilize in their decision making so that's the sort of distinction we kind of always say data is data but it it doesn't provide you much if you don't apply those methods to convert that into an evidence which could be helpful for different stakeholders we don't have the perfect answer we're learning as as we build um in in some respects but um i think there was a realization that you know there was this untapped potential as i mentioned earlier um and that real world evidence was almost thought of as secondary to submission efforts and so we took a step back or actually maybe take a step forward and decided to invest in a, an organizational structure that really allowed for dedicated teams to be focusing on that conversion of real world data into real world evidence and so creating this organization allows a seat at that strategic table as well as creates that bridge between R&D and commercial. And so that is one of the you know, more um functional ways, structural ways that we try to encourage and and show an investment in this space as well as bringing in folks with experience. And it, it is a different mindset than your more traditional um development uh, talent. And so that there is um a bit of a gap I would say in in the talent pool there and that's one of our challenges people with experience that have that more flexible mindset it is a bit more creative in in some respects because this is a new new area and so um we've really invested a lot in that space to have dedicated groups to provide a place at the table and make sure that they're at both the R&D table and the commercial table so they can create those feedback loops um and leverage real world data across the whole life cycle. We have been engaged in in developing strategically the use of real world data to support research, commercial and development uh, about 4 or 5 years ago. And we started a little bit like Tiffany mentioned the central team building uh first the platform uh with very specific characteristics from the, from the traceability security point of view where we could put our internal data and external data in a combined way but also advanced analytics competence we did not have before and of course we had the descriptive analytics conventional analytics already in place now this team has worked very efficiently to show the the potency of these tools to answer questions by combining data very very different from what was available before applied to life cycle management questions applied to efficiency in the clinical trials applied to how you measure uh, real time real life the the usage of our product uh but the the the, the 
the company realized that the implementation of the tool in the different product teams during the development phase or in the different commercial teams in the post-marketing phase was much slower than what they had envisioned initially. So we moved from a pure central team and that's currently what is happening to what we call a hub and spoke. So we keep centrally the platform, the data, the data governance, some key methodology and standardization necessary to have a com common view around how you manage these data across the company. But then you develop spoke. In the R&D, there are two spoke, one in R and one in D, and the different global business units, because you want to be as close as possible to answer the what and why questions at the team level. And a central team becomes a bottleneck. So the transformation is ongoing. Um, we, I need to wait a little bit to see the impact of this move from a central team to a hub, hub and spoke. But clearly we see an acceleration of the use of the data at different phase of the company. And we predict that it's only the beginning. One of the, probably the biggest barriers for success or rapid success, I should say, in the way companies look at this, mainly because it's it's a little bit of what Tiffany was just saying. It's how do you organize this information? How do you, how does the ingestation of the right information get put into the system so that people can actually make, make use of that? The second is it just cuts across a lot of internal boundaries that we've conventionally built for these silos of the way we've been operating. And I think um, to convert this information into things that can be useful, whether that's understanding the, you know, the right uh, cohort of patients that we should do a trial on, whether we can use this for synthetic trial information, um, how does that convert into the way in which a customer ultimately will select which patients will be eligible for this, or insurance providers, uh, you know, uh, providing that cost-effective information. But as you think about it, it's a, it is an inevitability and it takes a lot of effort. And I think a lot of trial and error, frankly, uh, Craig, we we can try to say, here's the things to try to do in, in setting up your information properly to make sure you curate the data uh, carefully. Uh, I've seen a lot of mistakes just by the fact that, you know, kind of junky data got into the system and then that misled, you know, the decision making. Uh, so I think there's a tremendous amount of uh, things that we could structurally look at and systematically try to set up. But there's a cultural aspect to this, which is companies have to understand how they're going to participate in a team sport of real world data to real world evidence that's quite sometimes quite different than, than what they've been accustomed to. That being said, I think teams that I've watched get, go through this um, metamorphosis almost, once they get that understanding and they and they have developed some evidence and um, a great example is a project we did with sepsis and it was our team having to figure out how to work across these multiple boundaries but it was also working inside the healthcare system where they also had their own uh, institutional boundaries if you will but once we got that right and we could actually see how dramatically this was changing the delivery of care the patient's outcomes the cost of care uh, it got people really excited, and I think the the institutional, um, you know, uh, inertia that was that had to get overcome, like a flywheel almost, a very heavy lift to begin with. But once you kind of got it going, it it was more um, self evident for people why this works. So I would encourage anyone that's even if you you know kind of feels very hard or you stumble once or twice, uh, it's worth continuing down this path because there's really, truly, probably the most uh, advantageous ways we can change healthcare is through this mechanism. They have to take a balanced approach here as well. I think they have a responsibility that goes beyond uh, approvals of new medicines to population safety, to maintaining standards that have been put in place over years of uh, understanding of drug development. So to make a leap of faith here to go completely into synthetic controls and real world data would be challenging. So going from there to saying, uh, you know, can you um, use some mixed methods or hybrid models to say where it is really urgent, where it is needed, uh, where it's almost impossible to do new trials to demonstrate evidence, 
uh, can you then take a bit more risk? And they are willing to um, certainly move in this direction. I, I think as industry members, we always want them to move faster and we urge them to in, in any discussion that we take with them. But I see the importance that uh, many regulators have highlighted this. Um, there's also a churn going on in terms of what talent they bring in and who are the reviewers of this. Um, people who've actually written the guidances 20, 30 years ago um, are, are, are going to be changed soon and there will be new guidances coming in, but still those guidances are still in play. And as this happens, I think we'll see a lot more innovation coming in.